Hi, welcome to the show. My name's Lauren Epstein. You're listening to The Lauren Epstein Show. And today we have some special guests. We're going to be talking about cooperatives. Uh, as you know, coming to our show, you hear all sorts of things about jobs and careers. And today we are going to talk about a type of organization that is very, very successful in many, many countries and here in the United States, but you may not be aware of. You may have heard the word and may not know what it means. Uh, we are going to talk about worker cooperatives. With me today, I have my guests, Michael Alden Peck. He is the founder, uh, co-founder and executive director of One Worker, One Vote, an economic development nonprofit focusing on expanding widespread and deepened worker ownership through Mondragon Cooperative Worker Principles. Michael serves as Mondragon's North American delegate and as a corporate corporate <coughs> corporate advisory board member of the Blue Green Alliance. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. And also with us, we have Vernon Oaks. Vernon is the host of a radio show uh, called Everything Co-op. Isn't that that's right? Yep. Yeah. It. And that airs uh, on Thursdays um, morning on WOL. And, and WOL is what on the frequency? Dial? 1450 AM. 1450 AM in the D.C. area. Yes. Awesome. So if you're in the D.C. area, tune into WOL at 1450 um, on Thursdays. What time? 1030 to 1130 AM. 1030 to 1130. So it doesn't compete with our show. Okay. So listen to both shows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and he's the president of Oaks Management. He learned about cooperatives by managing housing cooperatives in his property management business. He loves the cooperative business model for teaching people how to start a business to produce quality products and create a surplus they can use to increase their financial wealth. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Glad you're both here. Thank you. My experience of cooperatives, I guess, started when I I moved to D.C. 25 years ago. I joined the United States Senate Federal Credit Union, Mm -hmm. which was, I think, my first experience of working in a co-op. And I, I, I'm going to tell you a quick story about what it was like, what it's like being a member of a cooperative bank. Uh, I was looking to get a car loan, mm-hmm. but my credit was just horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And the car loan was like $15,000 for a used car. So instead of filling out an application, the person at the bank said, well, just write a letter to the board. So I wrote a nice letter saying I've been a member for a while and, you know, I have a job. And, and they just approved me. They gave me the loan. And I know that that would have been a lot harder at a much higher rate if I was going through a commercial bank. So it got me very excited excited and interested in, in, in the value of cooperatives. There's not like as much of a profit motive. So um, Vernon, uh, we were talking before the show, Vernon's going to kind of talk about some of the kinds of cooperatives there are. All right. Let me give you, there are four basic types. There's a lot of different types, but they normally fall in four categories. It all depends on who owns and controls the business. And if it's owned and controlled by the people that work there, the employees, it's called a worker cooperative. So as you can imagine, any business you can think of could be owned and controlled by the employees and therefore a worker cooperative. Uh, Mike, can you give us some examples of the worker co-ops? Sure. So uh, we uh, are focusing on worker co-ops that are also uh, tied in with labor unions. So we call them union co-ops. And uh, here's three big examples. Um, In the city of Denver, you have a a union cab, um, which is um, uh, teamed up with the Communication Workers of America. Um, I think it's called Green Taxi. Um, And they have a 1,000 drivers. Uh, You have um, the... um, the cooperative healthcare workers, uh, about 2,000 people in Manhattan, they're teamed up with SEIU 1199. And in the state of Maine, you have 3,000 lobstermen. There are also women on those boats, but they refer to themselves as lobstermen. <laughs> I, I, I tried, I made the mistake of saying lobster people, and that didn't go over very well. <laughs> so uh, 3,000 lobstermen with the uh, industrial machinists, uh, lobstermen 207, and uh, they will um, get you your lobster within a day, Maine lobster, and it's a, it's a great, it's a great worker co-op. Well, let's, let's mm. talk about this so people understand exactly, we go a little slower, is that um, for the example for the green cab company, so what makes that a co-op and, and what actually happens? So uh, what makes it a co-op is that uh, the workers um, own- The cab drivers. The cab drivers that's, are the owners of that co-op. Uh, they have a share in the co-op um, and, what, and they also uh, practice workplace democracy. Uh, so the first part, when you say they have an ownership, what do they own? 
Well, it they own the equity of the co-op. A co-op cooperative is a business. It's a for for profit. There are non-profit co-ops, but the co-ops that we're talking about are for-profit co-ops. So you own a share in the business. Usually, everyone owns an equal share if it's a co-op based on Mondragon principles. Um, Can I say something real please. quick? Yeah, um, I got an MBA. Okay, and in the MBA. All of the exercises were based on we do this or we don't do this based on return on investment Yeah. to the shareholder. And normally that shareholder did not work in the business. They may not live in the city. They may not live in the state. They may be even out of the country. But the profits went to the shareholders of a for-profit capitalistic model, not the employees. In this model, that's what makes it so exciting is that the employees um, – based on one share per employee, it's not based on how much money you have, and that's within this shareholder market capitalistic model. The people that have the money are the ones that make the money. In the cooperative model, the employees, whether they have money or not, they have a share in it. They also have a right to govern. The second principle is democratic control. So they have one vote for for, uh, decisions. And they de- they decide what decisions they will work on and what decisions management will work on. They have control of the business. So if the three of us started a co-op, we would say, okay, we're all going to own an equal share of whatever the business is. Right. Right. We'd go and do the business, and then we would pay ourselves accordingly. Yeah, it's a very interesting dichotomy. Because well, well, let, me, let me just finish. So, yeah. so I think so. At least people can get this concept. In a we we and then if we if we hired somebody, they would get an equal share of the business. And so we own all own an equal share of this for profit company, and we all do our jobs. And they could be different jobs. I could be right. like the manager, and you could be the the baker of the baker. But right. but again, it's it's we're working in. And the two things you said is. We're, we're talking about the mission and the values. Mm-hmm. It's not about the the profits going someplace else. Mm-hmm. And also, we work in this democratic. Right. You, what was the right. term you used? Term, democratic management? Well, no, democratic workplace, workplace democracy. Workplace democracy. Yeah. So, in the 2008 Great Recession, which is something I'll, I'll come back to time and time again because I think it's a sine qua non, it's a before and after moment in, in, in recent U.S. history. Um, we were outsourcing like crazy in this country. We had 60,000 factories closed since NAFTA was signed. Um, we had uh, 2.5 million jobs you know, shuttered. We had, uh, I don't know if you've watched the videos, they're on YouTube, but uh, the workers were told to build the platform for the overseas owners to make the speech when they handed out the pink slips for the workers as they packed up the equipment and shipped it overseas. And uh, we were we were really focusing on creative destruction in this country. It was taught in all the business schools. It was the really cool thing, but nobody was focusing on creative reconstruction. I mean, there wasn't even a market for creative reconstruction. It's let's rip the factory out of the, out of the underbelly of of this community. Let's let everybody, you know, practice social Darwinism. If you survive, fine. If you don't, well, that's your problem. Um, uh, Service jobs, why not? Walmart, why not? Minimum wage, why not? You figure it out. Go fish. And what happens is we lost uh, generations of of people uh, to uh, that became underserved populations and underserved economies. And the recent 2016 election uh, showed that those people, you know, they have a voice and a vote. Uh, and, and we know what happened and we know why uh, to a great extent. And so the idea is um, if we if we don't want the past to be prologue, what can we do differently to restructure our economy? Practicing the rules of business 101, you know, good operations, good price point, good quality, good execution, good leadership, um, principles, sustainability, but doing something different with the structure so that we end up with a different ending besides so, massive inequality. Michael, what you're saying, and you're making a great argument for what's gone wrong. Like, clearly, we all know that the economy is not working for everyone, and it hasn't for a while. And that one solution is co-ops. Well, so let's give – I just want to just make sure folks really understand exactly what a co-op is before we kind of get into all the uh, – because I think it – because I'm still kind of let, – let's talk okay. about the, the co-op, right? So in a co-op, there's two things, right? There's we all own a share, and then there's democratic management, right? We're all kind of if, working if it, together. If it's a worker co-op. If it's a worker co-op. If it's a member co-op, it's different. Right. But getting back to the worker co-op, because I think that's – we'll talk about that. That is that right? Did I have that right? Is yes. Those are the two things? Right. Okay. So then there's the – other kind, the shareholder co-op. Well, there are shareholders, but you've got, if it's owned and controlled by the 
employees. It's called a worker cooperative. If it's owned and controlled by the people that buys the products or services, it's called a consumer cooperative. Like the consumer zone. Like REI, like credit unions that you talked about, like housing co-ops. Like Ace Hardware. Ace Hardware. There's a number of different consumers. There's a consumer cooperative in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a health co-op that the patients own the business. And I would like to have one of those because it's patient-centric. The patients decide the policies and the rules, not doctors or managers that perhaps don't even live there. So those are the two major types. And then you have, which a lot of farmers and artists are using, you have a consumer co-op. People, the farmers come together and they buy what they need together. They create a company that buys their feed, their fertilizer, their gasoline, the equipment. Okay, they may share the equipment. And they and so they get people in that knows the vendors and they know the different products and they create contracts that the farmers may not have time or knowledge to do. So it's called a consumer cooperative. And there's one in the district called CPA, Consumer Purchasing Allowance, that was, was developed for... Um, churches and for charter schools mainly, but they have a lot of different people, particularly nonprofits coming in to buy their trash, to buy their gas, to buy solar panels. So it, it's working that normally people get in co-ops, and I'll give you the fourth one, they get better products, as good as if not better, at a lower price. So the other on the other end of your farmer co-ops. Wait, hang on, because okay. you said the key thing here. They get something better for lower price. And that's what people will be like, well, where does the money go? It doesn't go to an investor. Is that well? It, you could say it's recycled locally. It's or it's recycled locally, but also the there's profits. not. It doesn't need to be profit for someone it, who's going to just it take doesn't, it away. It doesn't flow to ex-territorial shareholders. Right. Right. So whatever whatever profit there is, I like that. <laughs> I like it stays that. within the ecosystem. Right. Right. So it, in in that economics one hundred and one, the more the 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 more the um, money moves in a community, the the better quality of that community, the more profit, the more uh, financial wealth is in a community. And that's really important. I don't think people really understand that, that Mm -hmm. when you have a big box store come in, they take all your money and it goes to someplace else. Someplace else. You know, local businesses, they live there, they work there, they eat there, they shop there, that money stays there. And the more churn you have in an economy, the more velocity you have in an economy, the better off the economy is. But that also goes to the commoditization of labor, um, which is, you know, really what's happened in America. Um, So when you treat people as commodities uh, and you're practicing ex-territorial shareholders always been in control, it's really easy to, you know, make a decision where you close down a vital operation to a community because you don't know the people, you don't see the pain, you're not responsible for cleaning up the mess. You made a decision. They're here today, gone tomorrow. Someone else gets to live with it. And I think that separation of reality is what's produced the massive inequality, the massive disenfranchisement, the massive amounts of underserved populations. You know, when we, we talk about the 1% for the 90 99% that was that was yesterday's yesterday's ratio now it's so much worse it's like 0. 0.001 and everybody else mm. you know right. Mike, you're also <clears throat> talk about the pain in communities i'm from west virginia originally cold country mm-hmm. and you go back there and you just look at the pain the uh. pain is so phenomenal so clear and folks turn to drugs they have no hope Okay, and they have turned to drugs, tr- both to try to sell to get money and also to not, not be able to look at, there's nothing here for So us. I want to talk about, because we have, we have like a, another 45 minutes, so I want to talk about the, the beginnings of the concept of co-op and some of the really big success stories. I know, Michael, you're really connected to one of the largest co-ops in the world. Is right. that right? I, I, I am the uh, USA delegate, and I have been since 1999 for Mondragon, which is the world's largest worker industrial cooperative. And tell us the story of Mondragon. So um, Mondragon started at a moment of complete social breakdown, very comparable to the 2008 Great Recession here in the United States. Um, massive unemployment, um, famine. And where um, was this? And this is in the Basque region of Spain. So Spain, in nineteen fifties. W- well, it started in the mid. It started in the lower fifties, but uh, basically, Spain had gone through a civil war, a very destructive civil war, uh, and the Basque region had been on the wrong side of that civil war. And then, if you've seen Pablo Picasso's painting Guernica, uh, 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 Franco allowed um, the Axis powers, Hitler and Mussolini, to practice their aerial strafing uh, armament um, upgrades on 
defenseless Basque populations. Um, the Guernica uh, depicts what happened there, um, and 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 so basically, um, and after and after the the deprivations that came along with World War II, um, you had rubble. Famine and cholera, um, but mostly you had a social breakdown, exactly like what we had here in 2008, uh, when 11 million Americans, working class Americans, uh, got foreclosed um, and lost their homes where their equity used to be. Uh, and so, uh, what happened? Well, what happened was um, there was this very simple village priest. He wasn't a Jesuit. He wasn't, um, and he he was blind in one eye. He was on a bicycle. He was actually the substitute. The uh, the priest they sent to this little town called Mondragon, which is in the, the mountainous region of, of, of the Basque country of Spain, a region called Guizpuzcoa. Uh, he showed up because the, the, the first one they sent um, took a look and chickened out. And um, <laughs> he decided to, uh, to um, talk about collaboration and cooperation. Um, and he did this a number of ways. He, he, tr- he, he was very inspirational, but he was also very pragmatic. He organized sports events because when you're organizing soccer games, uh, people are collaborating, um, getting people together. Fifteen years later, uh, they created, uh, there was a little school. He graduated five engineers. They created a kerosene stove cooperative. The priest went down to Franco's Madrid to get Social Security benefits, uh, and they, they said, well, you know, what's a cooperative? How can we give Social Security benefits to uh, a cooperative? You know, neither fish, fowl, mineral, vegetable, what is it? So they started their own cooperative, Mutual. It's now called Lago Noro, one of the most um, productive and profitable in Europe. Um, so wait, just uh, just slow down a little bit. So they started a cooperative selling kerosene. They're selling selling uh, kerosene, kerosene stoves. Kerosene stoves. Right. And so this little group got together and built these stoves. Right, they built these stoves. And they all owned a piece of this they all own a, a, a one worker one vote one An worker, equal one, share. Vote, one worker one vote and right. and uh, also practice workplace democracy and practiced the principles of solidarity but they also brought in um, engineering skills and innovation and education uh, education you know was at, always at the beginning of self improvement um, reinvention was at the beginning of the Mondragon story um, so can I just add one thing please Here's, there are seven prin- uh, cooperative principles Very important. the fifth one is uh, information education and training. Why don't you go through all the Wait, principles? hang on. I, want, I, want to, I, want to go, I don't want to go so. all over the place with the show. So let's get the story first, because this is a really good story. It is. And, story. and so the, story. they started with, they, they were selling right. the kerosene stoves. And they did spin And this is the beginning of like what we would this say modern cooperative. Mid-50s, right? A, a, a modern worker cooperative yeah. in a, a mountainous region of Spain um, with, a, with, a, with a population, a best population that's a minority population that endured racism. Its language was banned under... Under Franco, its culture was banned. We're going to take a quick break. We'll take a quick break, and we're going to come back to the story. Okay. Hi, I'm Lauren Epstein, and you're listening to the Lauren Epstein Show, where we talk about jobs, careers, and the workplace. Here on ninety six point seven FM. If you're interested in being on the show, you can give me a call at two four zero eight seven six zero two seven six, or email me at Lauren L O R N E at electriccow.com. You can check out our Facebook page, which is Lauren Epstein, and also our Mixcloud account. So if you go to mixcloud.com, Lauren Epstein, you'll find our shows. Thanks so much. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein. Today, we're going to be talking about worker cooperatives. You are listening to 96.7 FM. With me today, I have Michael Peck and Vernon Oaks. Um, And Michael, you were telling us the story of... The Mondragon Cooperative. Right. right. So the first stove entered into what we would call the electro domestics white good marketplace. But started electro domestics white good. That's a fancy name for stoves, kitchens, baths. Um, and one cooperative did one thing, and another cooperative sprung out and did something else. And they kept spinning out cooperatives to meet different parts of this marketplace. Components over here, burners over there. Um, and before you knew it, you had a number of cooperatives. And in order to grow, they needed capital. The banks wouldn't lend to them, so uh, uh, Father Jose Maria Rizmendireta, the founding uh, village priest, decided to create his own bank. Um, and if you fast forward now, 60 years later, because we're we're 60 years, Mondragon is a 60 years experience. They Mondragon thinks it's presumptuous to call itself a model. A model is sort of a, an, an aggressive 
um, business school uh, approach, but they look at themselves as, as an experience. Um, there are over 240 different cooperatives. It's a $16 billion group. The school is now something called Mondragon University with 7,000 students. It's a cooperative faculty. Uh, the insurance the insurance mutual is called Lago Noro, and they have a, a $60 billion bank called Labro Cucha. So they're now, from starting from Stowe's, They've created businesses. Right. Can we call them businesses? Co-op- very for-profit. Right. So they're for-profit b- businesses, right? That provide uh, insurance, banking services, mm-hmm. retail. Uh, retail. They're the th- second or, or, or third largest retail uh, food operation in Spain. Automotive parts. Mondragon does two point two billion euros a year in automotive parts. We make the Orbea bicycle. We may. If you bought a pressure cooker in Macy's, we make we make that. Um, we make machines that make machines. We we make machine tools, machines that make machine tools. So cool. So very diversified. Vernon, give us some of the contrasting. This is, sounds really cool. Why is this better than a conventional business model? Well, we mentioned some of them already. The the workers in this case we're talking about, they make up the rules. But why is that better? Well, because when are they, they make smarter, up, I mean, are they collectively as, as are a, they doing better? Are there empirical evidence that says this is better. As a group of people coming together, making decisions, yes, they make better decisions long term. Okay, than an individual's making decisions, and they make those decisions short term. Too often, the the uh, the people in capitalistic uh, businesses are trying to increase the share price. So they're making short-term decisions that may not be good for the economy and the company long-term. So when you have a, a longer-term view, and this is what the, the members will do, the workers, they'll make, they'll make these longer-term decisions. Plus, they decide who will make what decisions. They, they, sometimes they would, if they're quick decisions that have to be made right away, they may say, management, you'll make these decisions, and here's how these are the parameters by which you make these decisions. So you get buy-in. And so is, is there any... In. That's awesome. And conceptually, I get it, right? Yeah. But is there any data that backs up that? Sure. So, you know, every factory that you can walk to in this country, um, workers talk about the wisdom that's lost in the factory floor because management doesn't respect and pay attention to its workers. Only the really best companies that have a fluid communication going up and down take advantage. And so when you have top-down vertical structures, which is the way corporate America has been organized with, as Vernon said, the shareholder um, getting all the financial benefits, um, as well as C-suites and and and, um, and executives, the differential in pay now in the United States is 350 to one. When, um, when we talk about the golden age of, of American manufacturing uh, following World War II, that pay ratio was uh, maybe 25 to 30 to 1. So what, what, you ha- what happened then was um, the CEO and the, and, the, and, the, and the working class families, they went to the same church, they went to the same school. Maybe the CEO's family lived on the hill and the workers' houses were at the bottom uh, or on the incline of a slope. Um, um, and, they, and the workers' family uh, the, drove a slightly less new car. But there was a lot of solidarity. There was a lot of shared platforms. Today that's gone. It's like that scene in the movie from Jerry Maguire where um, she says, you know, first class used to be a better meal. Now it's a better life. I think we've now gone into this autarkic uh, existence in America where where we have the 0.001%, you know, living their privatized life and everybody else waiting in line uh, for things that don't happen to them that should. And, And this inequality, this inequality is like a tax. And it's also inherently um, contradictory because the United States economy, the GNP, is still 70 percent consumer based. Um, And so if you don't empower consumers, where is the capital going to come from that's going to make the economy perform? So, uh, again, that's a great I I get what you're saying. And I'm going to get back to the original question is what is the data of comparing a cooperative business that makes it better than a uh, Capitalistic or ROI sure. business. So I, I would I would answer it this way: when things are going rosy, everybody's a genius. All the when when there's profits, when there's a market upturn, uh, everybody's graphs are pointing in the right direction. I think the best way to measure this is who does well during a market downturn. And now there is a lot of academic evidence that shows that worker-owned companies, where there is uh, extremely uh, well documented practices of workplace democracy are much more resilient during downturns. Um, more productivity, um, workers stay, uh, they get to vote about how to live to fight another day instead of, you know, being um, 
let being, go. being let go for reasons that may have very little to do with their actual performance. Um, so, and so, the, and so, from a local living economy perspective, worker-owned businesses are much better during downturns than workers that are that organizations that are not worker-owned. And you address local living economy, and we'll talk about that in a second. But so, what my experience was, I was in California working in Silicon Valley during the tech boom and the tech bust. And when we, re- when, as soon as we hit like the bus, like around uh, March of 2001, we let off, uh, we let go about 200 people. We still were hiring people, but for some reason there was a need to let go of 200 people. Out of the 200 we let go, we had to bring back a bunch of them because we needed them. But at lower so, wages and less benefits, most uh, No, no, no. It was the same. It just it was a technology company. But it was like this knee- knee-jerk reaction that, okay, the stock price is going down. We need to let go of people. And I think kind of to your argument, when the economy is going down, uh, our, our companies just fire people. Right? That's, that's like a short-term a, view. That's a short-term that's a view. Short-term right. view. And that, that happens even, even in companies who do need the people. Like it's completely ar- capricious and arbitrary that that, that, that occurs. Right. But in a cooperative, you're saying, if I'm in a cooperative and I live in this community and there's a downturn in the economy, I'm probably not going to lose my job. Um, and we're all just going to kind of suck it up and we're going to get through this together and, and live through the lean times instead of people falling off and like Lauren, dying me, through the lean times. Let me give you a quick example. I, I told you I do property management. So I manage several co-ops in the district and in around the district. So a number of these co-ops will create what they call a hardship reserve. So that if one of the members loses their jobs or gets sick or, or something, then they could they could live off of this for about three months. They have it set up. They they have a com- committee that manages it, and so the idea is that the members are looking out for each other. Right. Okay. Try that in an apartment building, if you will. <laughs> okay, where there's a shareholder who owns it, and somebody doesn't pay for three months and see what happens. I know because I've been there. Okay. No, they they're gone. But in a co-op. The idea of when people are working for each other, they end up doing things that are different from this this sort of what's the return on investment idea, this short-term sort of look. What's the long-term view for the members? What's best for the members? And I would really like for Mike to talk about what they did in Montagon in 08, okay, when they had one company that went under, but nobody lost a job. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's and, – and thank you, Vernon. Um, we, we've totally um, uh, lost this concept of solidarity in this country. Um, and it's been, you know, how much is enough? It's an unanswerable question. Um, we have no compunction about off, offshoring and outsourcing, uh, um, treating labor as a commodity. And then we're, we wonder why um, underserved populations, disenfranchised populations uh, vote politically the way they do. Uh, we've given them um, no alternative. Um, and, and so if we're going to restructure uh, America, um, I mean, people came here either looking to own something or they came as property. And for those who came as property, their struggle has been more intense than anybody else because they first had to uh, liberate from that and then try and um, succeed in the American dream of owning something. For those people who came because they couldn't own land, because they were tired of tugging the forelock, um, it's been about land ownership. And then it was about home ownership. And now it's about workplace ownership. With modern technology, uh, work play it the lines are all blurred we we've forgotten when we're working and when we're playing there's no such thing as a nine to five job anymore um there's a job that depends on you turning off your smartphone Uh, so in that kind of concept unless we redefine the boundaries and the structures of who gets what who's entitled to what and how you can earn something in a different way as opposed to redistribution versus uh, laissez-faireism the typical left right divides that are so boring people are equally bored and the, the arguments have gone on forever and they haven't resolved something you can have a totally capitalistic experience but with a much nicer progressive outcome and if these companies are focused on being profitable and they are cooperatives know they have to be profitable because the trick is to align the profits with the values. When you work hard and you earn your profits and then each individual worker owner votes for the values, aligns his and her values 
with 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 the profits that they earned that is the social solidarity to ching moment when all of a sudden you have a local living economy that's taking place and it's resilient and it's putting stakeholders on a equal level with shareholders and we don't talk about outsourcing or offshoring we don't talk about um, uh, depriving our people of an education or health care we don't talk about inferior food we don't talk about the actuarial tables which show that if you're born poor in America you're going to live 10 years less than everybody else or 20 or 20 so one of the things that's interesting when i was started working in the in the 70s is that it seemed like there was a lot of money in businesses there was like a lot more money that was being spent on the employees on the communities and then something shifted and i think there may have been a tax law in the 80s that got changed but now the money doesn't stay in a corporation there's either a hedge fund or the shareholders and whatever profits come up get pushed out you know often just as a professional in my job, I won't have the kind of resources that I need to do it. Like I'd like to spend, say, twenty thousand dollars. Like, well, no, no, we don't have that. We only have five thousand. Even though I'm looking to build the company, that those resources, a lot of my peers and people in general in in you know for-profit businesses don't have those resources to do those things. Don't have the resources to send people to to trainings or to workshops or, like you said, support education. So it sounds like overarching, this is better for the entire ecosystem. Right. I mean, I think we've understood in America that all the waste in the country is at the top. We spend our time arguing whether it's going to be $15 or $12 for a minimum wage, whether they're going to allow mothers to stay with their children after they're born. Uh, we, we argue about these things day in and day out uh, because um, that, that allows us to pit each other against ourselves and waste our time. But if you look at where the profits are and you look at the waste that accrues to those profits, and you look at what just a little bit more of a solidarity type solution could do, uh, it, it, it's it's truly unbelievable. Um, most foundations, people running after uh, foundation grants for twenty five or thirty five thousand, then you read about uh, corporate business jaunts that spend a hundred thousand dollars on a meal. If you've ever if you've ever um, uh, owned a share in a publicly traded company and gone to that annual shareholder meeting. That's the most democratic, undemocratic experience that is. I mean, it's almost like an oxymoron to call that shareholder democracy. So if we are going to be a democracy, if we are going to believe in what we preach um, in our Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights, that um, it's one citizen, one vote, one worker, one vote, then how do we put democracy back into our workplaces? All right. So the people listening to this show and these people listening to the show could be listening in another country or another state. How do I go and form a co-op? Great question. Forming co-ops, we, we, the worker cooperative is a, as a model. There, there are different places you can get. And I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, you, but these are legal everywhere, right? A co-op is legal everywhere. Well, they're yeah. hemming and hawing. Maybe not. Well, it, it may not be legal in your state, um, but you can get organized as a co-op in every state. Some some states have better co-op laws than others. And how would I find out about that? You could go to the National Cooperative Business Association, NCBA. They should be able to tell you. Great. Okay, so. NCBA.coop. You can find their, their web page. So walk me through it, Vernon. The three of us are going to start a co-op. All right. The three of us are going to start a co-op. Oh, and Apple Tay. So four of us. Four of us. So um, we normally would decide what kind of business it is. What's our well, it's a radio show business, right? Radio show. Okay. And... Um, you actually started one of those, weren't it? <laughs> so <laughs> um, we have to get incorporated. We're going to decide if we're going to be a LLC or we're going to be a corporation or what we're going to be. Um, and I was just doing this with my property management company of getting the employees to buy it as a co-op. The lo- it takes longer to form a co-op normally because of the training that goes into it. You really want to make sure that people understand the the Well, wait, walk me through. So, so do we pick, how do we pick either LLC or S or C? It, it really depends on what it is that we want. Okay. And working with a, an attorney to talk about, here's what we want to do. And the type of business. The type of business. Okay. And what kinds of uh, risk are involved. Okay. So in let's say brain. we picked an LLC. Now we're all in this LLC. Right. Called the Vernon Oaks LLC. Uh, let's make it some kind of co-op. The radio, radio, sh- um, community radio co-op. Right there, you go. So we got community radio co-op. So we have we have to sit down and make several decisions together. Okay. So what we did in forming Oaks Management Co-op was 
uh, we hired a guy named Jim Johnson from Don, D-A-W-N, uh, to come in and help us to lay out this co-op. Um, then we, I get so excited here about to shake the place down. <laughs> I'm telling Brennan not to bang on the table. <laughs> okay. And he's like, he's like, he's got a lot of energy about this is great. And then we hired somebody to come in and, and teach us about how you make decisions. Okay. Because in the hierarchy at which we're mostly used to, whether it's the church, the family or, or business, it's normally somebody at the top making decisions. So how are we going to make decisions, the four of us? Okay. And then we broke those decisions down to different types of decision and whether or not we were going to hire Mike as the, I don't know, production manager. And so he can decide who's going to be on the show. And Lauren, you're going to be the host. And so you may lay out with Mike who you want for the next three or four months. But who's going to make those decisions? Okay. And then Afote and I are going to decide how we're going to spend the money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the profit that we make. I like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we can also butt in on that because we're co-owners of that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think this is a very interesting moment because um, people always talk about, uh, well, you know, worker co-ops, uh, workers on their own stock. Um, that's not really a good idea because then the workers have all their eggs in one basket. And what they don't understand is that two-thirds of America's workplace, workforce, don't have a basket and don't have eggs. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, I think that's, once again, that's a very privileged comment. Um, so, so when we talk about the worker owner, um, it's, it's a liberating formula. Uh, the worker part of the worker owner, he or she wants the highest possible wage he or she can negotiate. But the owner part of the worker owner wants the most sustainable enterprise because the equity play is what he or she is interested in. And so I want to talk about we, we want to talk about the equity component a little bit later. Right, but this is a, that's the that's this, the upside. This is, this is creative tension. Yeah. There's no right answer for this, but it forces a series of trade offs and decisions that liberates the worker owner and makes him or her much more knowledgeable about their enterprise and also understanding the trials and tribulations of ownership because ownership is not a free ride. Ownership is a much bigger personal implication than just punching the clock. So yeah. workers in a, so this is a great argument. Workers who have an ownership stake are much more informed, much more engaged because they have to know. Yeah. Right? I mean, right. they just by the sheer yeah. fact that they're, they, right. Right. And when they're was, owners, they have to, to know To go back to on. West Virginia, um, when I was working for the late, great Senator Robert C. Byrd, um, he would, uh, we would drive by this car wash in Martinsburg, West Virginia, that a big neon sign that said, says nobody ever washes a rental car. You only wash your own car. You wash your own car. You wash the car you own. So get me back to the building this co-op. We've picked a solution. We've learned how to make decisions collectively. Right. And that was the part I was going to go back to is that's the, that is, that turned out to be the hardest part uh -huh. because are you going to have to 51% uh, to, do we need three of the four of us to make a decision? Do we need all four of us to make a decision? And Consensus which or majority? Yeah. Or okay. We have to make those decisions. And what I did not say, if, if, a, if we are going to decide who, who's, where the money's going to go, all four of us have to decide who's going to be doing what. Okay. Right. That's, that's a big piece of it. And quite frankly, that's where the fun comes in. <laughs> but I've also learned that one of the reasons there are not more co-ops is because it is hard work. Right. It is work. You've got you've got to do your production job. It per, you've got to you've got to host it. But now you've got to put your management hat on after you host it. Okay. Um, Equal Exchange is a worker-owned cooperative. They do a great products, coffee and uh, right. peanuts and a whole bunch of different things, and they believe in fair trade. But when I've had them on my show, is this conversation about? Okay, I'm working now. I'm working. And I do my job from eight to five. And then I take that hat off and I put on the hat of, of being a board member. So now I've got to go into the board. And during the day, the manager of the company, the CEO, he's my boss. But in the board meeting, I'm the chair of the board. I'm his boss. So those roles switch. And you got to be able to learn how to play those roles. And then what, what meeting are you in and what are you going to be doing in that meeting? So it is hard work. But see, it's liberating work. Right. This is what I like about it. I've got a 16 uh, seniors who run a co-op that's 16 units. And 
I, at one point, I don't think there was even the best of high school education in there. But they hold each other accountable. And that co-op is run extremely well. They take care of business. Okay. And there's not MBAs or blah, blah, blah. They just go in and they've learned. They had a year's worth of training. And they learn how to run businesses. They learn how to hold each other accountable to know what, what they're responsible for. And they make sure that each of them are doing what they're supposed to do. And so what are some of the upsides of the ownership component, right? So if I get into a workers' co-op, I'm in this co-op, right? The the communication cooperative co and, and so what do I get at the end? Like, Can, I, can I give you an example of housing first? Sure. Yeah, sure. There, there the uh, research done that looked at HUD-sponsored mm-hmm. um, co-ops and HUD-sponsored apartments. Every variable, the HUD-sponsored co-ops outperform the apartment buildings. And that question says, why aren't there more HUD com- co-ops? Because they're spending all of their money for apartments. And that gets into the politics. But people felt better at home there because it was a community. Um, they knew each other. They knew who was uh, uh, causing problems and who weren't. They learned how to, t- to work with uh, police officers and council people, so they got things done. Um, their rents were lower. Okay, there was a, uh, after 40 years as a co-op in, in uh, Atlanta, they paid $200 less. For, for two bedroom, it was $500 a month. Down the street for apartment building, it was seven or 800. The, the property was in better shape because the co-op members took some of that profit and they fixed roofs and fixed windows and fixed uh, hallways and so forth. We're in apartment building when they're looking to take out the money. The short term is you don't spend money on those things. You let her run down because after 15 years, more often than not, or 20 years, they're not going to be there. So they don't reinvest for the apartment. But every rule you get, every variable you can look at, the apartment co-op, the co-op rather, sponsored, HUD sponsored, they outperform the apartment building. But getting, and, and that's great. That's a great example. And what do I get if I'm a worker in a worker co-op and I've been working for... 30 years, 40 years, I'm done, and I've got right. my shares. Right. Well, first of all, or share. First of all, you've had the um, luxury of being able to make a decision and having a voice and a vote. Uh, you also have a share in that cooperative. If, if it's a profitable business, then you will have the same share when you retire that everybody else has when they retire. You've been able to participate in the decisions of that cooperative. You've been able to decide. You've been able to fulfill uh, and maybe cross-train. Or maybe you've been able to participate so that you weren't a commoditized cog in some machine. You were someone whose opinion uh, meant something. And so I think when we talk about the breakdown of America, um, we're, we're, we're getting to understand that it's not a question of of thinking smarter, not richer. It's not a question of how much money we can throw at the problem. It's not a question of top down. It's a question of bottom up. What what we need is to re-infuse our ownership culture, our founding ownership culture back into the way this country set up. So what about, but again, the getting, get, that's my question is, do I get money at the end of my, can I sell my share? You can sell, you can sell your share. And who do equity. I sell it to? It is it depends on what the group had decided, the four of us, what we okay. decide. So I might sell it we back to the co-op. Maybe sell it back to the co-op. And, and I get that money, and it's uh, like my retirement. Right, yeah. And yeah. is it significantly, Could should be significantly more? It, it, well, it, it, it depends ahead. on the business. But uh-huh. uh, people have retired very well from profitable businesses um, with their co-op share. And is it common in, at the Madrigon in Spain that people I, retire well? With the, what people say when they go to Madrigon, which again is a working class town, of about 35,000 people. They say they don't see any McMansions, but there's nobody begging in the streets. Right. So I can have a decent retirement. You can have a rising, decent, honorable, middle-class life. Right. And you feel really good about self. Right. And the community feels good about... That's right. That's what I I was talking about West Virginia. Mm -hmm. You go down there and you look at communities. You can see the the downness. You can feel it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when you go into an organization or to a company, or in this case, a community, you can feel that upbeat. Right. You can, right. You can sense it. It's and it's a, it's a much better quality of life. Right. And right. I could, if I was part of a cooperative, I might say, well, you know what, let's, let's have a lifetime benefit, right? So a small pension, right. that, and that might right. be something that you can do with a company that doesn't fall right. off in bad times. So I, if the company can stay... You right. know, and we're level, not, we're not. They can afford those kinds of products that's for their right. employees. And and with the right kind of 
um, uh, cultural shift, we have the foundation in this country to actually achieve a more solidarity-based culture that is simultaneously more productive, more competitive, and more fair. We have over 29,000 cooperatives in this country. That's what I want to ask you next. And we're going to take a quick break, just a quick break, and we'll be right back. Um, you're listening to The Lauren Epstein Show. I'm your host, Lauren Epstein, uh, here on 96.7 FM. Vernon's doing his, is that your dance? This excitement. It's his excitement <laughs> dance. We'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren Epstein. Every week I talk about jobs and careers on 96.7 FM, Arlington, Virginia, at 10 a.m., Mondays. Hi, welcome back to the show. I'm Lauren Epstein. You're listening to The Lauren Epstein Show here on 96.7 FM. And we are going to talk about... The cooperative movement in the United States of America. Yeah, because here in the United States... We have it, a lot of cooperatives. We have a lot of cooperatives. We have 29,000 cooperatives. We have 350 million memberships in those cooperatives. There's about 350 million memberships. Uh, 350 million memberships in those cooperatives with just 310 million uh, Americans. So there's 40 million memberships. People have more than one. Uh, for example, so it's probably that a lot of people could, are just in multiple cooperatives. You could right. belong to your food co-op. You could belong to the credit union and so forth. There's the rural electric co-op. Um, these are the underpinnings of the country. And as Vernon pointed out, there are seven cooperative principles that all cooperatives um, believe in and do their best to all practice. Right, get out your pen and pencil because we're going to let Vernon talk about the seven principles. Well, these seven principles was found in 1844 right. in England. In okay. Bye. Yes. But the Rushville, the Rushville Partners um, um, Rush in Northwest near Manchester, where unions and cooperatives were created at just about the same time in history. So I'm going off from memory, so I'm going to need help with the fourth sure. one. But the first one is open to all. Everybody can, can join. Voluntary membership. Doesn't make any difference. Gender, political persuasion, Christianity or whatever, hmm. uh, or religion. So then um, the second is a democratic control. Okay. That there's this one member, one vote. So most of them, just as a curiosity, is it mostly majority, like 51, or is it mostly consensus, like as far as making decisions? I, I do not know the mostly of Because here in a democracy, it's majority, right? It's, it's majority. 51%, yeah. and then that's the decision. As we were looking at it in, this, in, in the business I was talking about, it would depend on, the, on what the decision was going to be. Okay. Okay. So... Um, whether or not it was consensus and the, the group that, uh, of, of employees was okay. thinking more of consensus. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, then the third one is owner economic uh, participation. You pay in and you get out. You, the, normally there's some payment in, um, $100 to, for a share or some, some amount of money. Uh, food co-ops have, have been running about $100, the ones that I've looked at, but they may say give me $10 a month. They may find different ways that you pay in. And if there's a profit, then you get out. In a food co-op, a lot of times you would get you would, you would get money back based on how much you have spent into that food co-op. Okay, so the more you spend, the more you get back when there's a profit. Right. Um, the third one is uh, autonomy and independence. I'm sorry, what? I didn't... Well, the third one is on economic. The fourth one is autonomy and independence. Autonomy. That's autonomy. Autonomy. So that you have to have control over it. You cannot have the government or some uh, financial or to, or to come in and have control. Okay. The, the uh, members have to have control. The fifth one we talk about education, training, and information. What does that mean? Education. It's a it's the that's the backbone of co ops. Is that people have to have knowledge in order to make informed decisions. So transparency has to be there. This openness. So and the books are I, open. Uh, everything. Self improvement. Reinvention. Yeah, and the financial books are open. Right. Yeah, you have to know it. Then the, the uh, sixth one is cooperation among cooperatives, and that's what you find a lot in Mondragon, and we're doing it here. We're housing co-ops. We're working with credit unions. Uh, credit unions are getting the housing co-ops. They're putting money in there, and we're getting uh, share loans back. So this this cooperation and food co-ops. Uh, then the, the seventh one is concern for community. Hmm. So it's built into the principles, this environment, to take care of the environment we're in. We only have one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we could really get into conversations about our current political administration and what they believe, but we won't go there right now. I don't okay. So upside in in uh, in Spain in this area, uh, the Basque region, 
what are, and, and other places where there's co-ops, what are some of the upsides? Like you said a few, but let's, so, let's kind of go over like all the benefits of being in a co-op. Right. So um, it, it, the polls show that in America, when we talk about inequality, it doesn't poll as well as when we talk about fairness. Americans are overwhelmingly for fairness. They don't always know what they think when they talk about inequality. Um, but let's talk about fairness. Um, fairness means that you have an equal opportunity, you have equal opportunity for social mobility, you have an equal opportunity for uh, wealth aggregation or income, um, and um, that is not dependent on race, gender, creed, uh, geography, um, which is exactly the opposite of what's happening right now in the United States. We are soon to be the most unequal of all countries on the OECD roster. Um, unequal in terms of the wealthiest un- and the poorest. In, 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 unequal in terms of wealth, unequal in terms of opportunity, unequal in terms of mobility. We've almost reached Calvinism prede- predestination. Who you are born to and which family you are born to and where you are born almost determines how far you go and also how long you live. The actuarial tables are showing in the United States that if you're born poor black, poor white, poor brown in underserved America, you will live 10 years less than someone who's born in a privileged community on the coast. So already it's a matter of life and death. Uh, The Mondragon region of Spain and the Basque region of Spain, there's something called the Gini Index. It's used by the World Bank. It's used by multilaterals. It measures inequality. Uh, The Basque region of Spain and Mondragon in particular scores the lowest on the Gini, which is means less. The United States is one of the highest scores. And so if if right now you see corporations that are beginning to understand about corporate social responsibility, they're beginning to understand that the environment is not a tax, it's an opportunity. Uh, people are beginning to understand the values that some of us intrinsically thought were patently obvious, but unfortunately they weren't. Now we're about to understand the horrible tax on society as a whole when unfairness or structural inequalities run unchecked. What happens in America is that we have complete polarization. We have a complete breakdown of our political system where barely 63% of the population vote. We have now... In in the Basque region, do they vote more? Absolutely. What what do they vote as far as the political... I don't don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but I can tell you that um, it's a very intense political environment. There's 2 million people in the the Basque vote, and and, and usually in Spain it's around the 70, 75% uh, participation rate. Mm -hmm. Um, Europe... Traditionally, has been between the 55% and the 75%. No, so, I, 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 go ahead, Brandon. We're gonna, hey, real quickly, I lived in Puerto Rico for five years. And there, when the politics were around, you thought there were going to be fights in the street. They were all out there. All, and I believe it was like 80% of the people voted. And I recently learned, about a couple of years ago, that in Puerto Rico, every household is allowed, like they belong to five different co-ops. And I wonder, I haven't seen any stats on it, but I wonder if belonging to co-ops in Puerto Rico caused them to be more active in the political system. So I wish we, I would love to have more time to talk to you guys. We're running out, but I wanted to let you know that I really appreciate you talking about this. I think uh, out of the shows that we do, this is the kind of information that can move our society in the right direction. Well, we really appreciate your mind and intellect and how you've applied yourself to this theme, and we hope you continue to do it. Thanks. And Michael, how can folks reach out to you if they want to follow up? Uh, they can email me or they can go to oneworkeronevote.org and find me. Okay. And Vernon, how can they find you? Lauren, thank you so very much. You're welcome. For me, it is uh, everything.coop. Everything.coop. Yeah. <laughs> and again, your radio show is on WOL 1450. Yeah. AM on the AM dial right. here in Washington DC right. on 10:30 to 11:30 Thursdays on Thursday morning. from 10:30 to 11:30 you should yeah. listen to that show. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. This is a great show. Thank I really you, appreciate it. You've been listening to The Lauren Epstein Show. I'm your host Lauren Epstein here on 96.7 FM and we will see you next week at 10 a.m. on Monday. Mm-hmm.